Good job, both of you. It's great to be up here with you. So um, we've got about 15 minutes, so uh, I'll, I'll follow up on a couple of the points that we heard uh, for those of us who uh, remain. Uh, and I guess to both of you, I would say it's interesting perspectives, right? You have an example of uh, Tesla as an industry leader uh, and, and a part of the industry that's moving forward despite the participation or in spite of the lack of participation of government enablers. And you have an industry in the traditional fossil fuel industry that may have um, a, a lack of planning on the part of government uh, and kind of struggling through this, uh, yet they're also innovating. So where can both of these industries, John, work uh, despite the kind of government planning that, uh, that you're talking about to still get to a place of less dependence on foreign sources of fossil fuel, which we have certainly seen that we're moving in that direction, right? Well, one of the big problems that the oil and gas industry has in particular is its own fragmentation. So you have 100% focused independent oil producers, natural gas producers, who only work in the United States. Mm -hmm. But at the thought leader level, you have representatives from global oil companies who aren't looking for U.S. energy independence. They're looking for global energy security in whatever way, shape, or form that takes place. And they sell a very strong message. And so whether it's the Exxon Mobiles, the Shells, the Chevrons, the BPs, the Totals, the Anadarkos, or, or whomever, they have a very different interest in the outcome. Their interest is in a stable global environment in which they can do their business anywhere. And then they affect a lot of the thinking of a lot of elected representatives on Capitol Hill and at state houses across the country about the importance of protecting their global interests while you have others who are very focused on the national interest. And so there's a fragmentation here that has to be resolved somehow. And I don't expect it to be resolved voluntarily by Because the it industry. seems like a lot of the industry and a lot of the industry interests are what ultimately get in the way of a all of the above kind of energy plan, which we've now heard, you know, certainly President Obama and, and even President Bush to some degree talking about embracing some technological advance as well as relying on traditional sources and doing all of the above. That's correct. In a perfect world, you could do that. Mm -hmm. But it's not a perfect world. And in recent years, um, my argument is that the authoritarians are winning, whether it's China, mm -hmm. whether it's Russia, whether it's uh, Middle Eastern, uh, autocrats or whomever, they will pursue what they will pursue in their own self-interest, their own national interest, while the so-called good guys, the Western democracies, lose out. And, and that's where I think we are into a period of time, and I don't know how long it lasts, where I think we need a change of mind around the importance of a national interest mm -hmm. and the importance of what is best for America uh, in, 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 the, in the near term. But JB, isn't some, I mean, isn't your company an example of where this is kind of happening, you know, in spite of what may not be happening at the national governmental level? I mean, you're just kind of moving ahead and filling that void. I, to, I think to some extent that's exactly right. You know, we, we just take a more product focused approach mm -hmm. and, um, you know, there, there definitely is some lack of, I think, leadership and lack of consistency in, in sort of waiting for the government or waiting for a plan to unfold. I, I agree with you on that. Um, you know, we've basically said that, you know, we see a compelling product that can be made with technology that exists today and we're going to make it and, and push ahead as fast as we can. Um, and we're I think both seeing the market but also creating the market, right? With, it, with I mean, the battery, just your discussion of battery life and those enhancements do a lot to create the market for you. Yeah, and I do think that actually having the products there, you know, can help inform, you know, policy and can help pull a plan, you know, from the people in government that, that may not quite see the, the capabilities or see the, the, the pathway. Um, we've, we've had, you know, pretty meaningful discussions with multiple different agencies, um, you know, helping show them, you know, where the roadmap is going on cost and performance. And I think it can give them a little more confidence and, and maybe, you know, faith to sort of, you know, be more commit, you know, commitment oriented on a new plan. It's, it's striking that, and this is a, a media problem as well, which is, you know, in the absence of high uh, gas prices, you don't see the imperative to, for instance, we'll see if there's questions about energy policy uh, at our upcoming debates. Um, I suspect there will be, but it's certainly not going to be top of mind. There's going to be other 
you know, whether it's terrorism or Russia or, you know, uh, Syria um, and other, you know, domestic issues, workers, economic expansion, perhaps less on energy, uh, there'd be more of an imperative with higher uh, gas prices. What have you seen or heard in this campaign or what do you think government ought to prioritize in a new administration to get farther along the path? Well, I, I would offer very frankly two things. I don't think the Republican candidate has studied energy in any respect. And he's only repeating what he's been told by others. I don't think he has any initiative or idea that's any different than what has already been articulated out there in the marketplace for more of the, more of the traditional same. Mm -hmm. And my argument is more of the traditional same isn't going to get us where we need to go. On the Democratic side, I'm hearing a very different Hillary Clinton in 2016 from 2008. In 2008, and I will confess to being a supporter of hers in 2008, I helped her write an energy speech which talked about how she could do a deal with the oil companies for more production in return for more royalties from the energy companies. I don't hear her talking about that anymore. I only hear her talking about wind, solar, and renewable energy. And, and so I don't think she has really uh, come to grips with the importance. And if she's president, she will face the importance of what oil price means. Mm -hmm. and, and if she isn't anxious to help uh, with the, you know, in, in a sense, the uh, transitioning of the fossil energy industry to more domestic focus and domestic attention, she'll be in charge of a country that is just seeing escalating oil prices with no way to respond to it. Is that, is that a short-sighted approach, wind, solar, renewables? Is there not enough of a market there to build an energy plan on? I mean, I, I think there is. And I think, you know, one of the things the government could really benefit the industry with is a bit more consistency in their approach and in the incentives that are, you know, leading us down that path. Um, you know, that's been a very difficult part of that industry's growth is, you know, kind of being on the edge of a cliff constantly of, you know, what will the next policy be? You know, will there be sustained support? Will it evaporate? Um, you know, it, it makes the financing very difficult. It, you know, kind of makes a seesaw effect mm -hmm. for all those companies. I mean, the problem is that you're dealing with an industry that as prices stay low, that either go higher. I mean, the, the industry has to be subsidized, right, globally. So if prices don't get higher, they can't do that. And they need a way, an off-ramp to be able to, trans, to transition te technologically into a new future, right? But there's a very good study by Mark Jacobson of Stanford University that talks about 100% wind and solar energy as a supply system. Uh, it's technically a brilliant article. It makes a lot of sense technically. What it doesn't take into account, however, are all the who, what, why, when, where, how questions of making it happen. It just assumes it will be possible. And when you see the resistance to offshore wind, that we're getting in this country. Now you're seeing resistance to large solar farms because of the amount of turf that is covered by the solar panels. Uh, what the energy industry faces continuously without a larger plan, without an architecture that we can all sign up to is petty resistance from anybody who has a backyard. Mm -hmm. and, and so this whole not in my backyard syndrome, whether it's driven for uh, environmental reasons whether it's driven for inconvenience reasons or whatever other reasons it might be, uh, we can't get there from here to get 100% of one thing ever. Mm -hmm. So I don't think solar and wind will do it. I think there has to be an accounting for nuclear. Why wouldn't we use nuclear energy when it's two million times more energy dense than even gasoline, which is the densest energy source we mostly touch? And, that, and nuclear is two million times greater in density and we haven't figured out how to master nuclear energy, of course we know how to master it. We choose not to. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, until we get that architecture, I don't hold out hope for getting our hands or any president getting their hand around what the energy future is going to look like. JB, let me ask you about automated cars and also about batteries. I mean, we hear a lot, you know, if you get on an airplane now, you know, you hear about the dangers of lithium uh, batteries. What, what is the, the safety level and how do we balance that kind of uh, public concern with some of the realities? Yeah, well, I, I mean, batteries, just like any energy storage device, you know, have a safety aspect to them. You're, you're jamming more and more energy into a smaller and smaller container. 
And you know, as we've seen, those energy density levels keep going up, safety you know, concerns go up with them. Um, you know, the, the criticality of how you design the circuitry and the, the protection systems uh, is, is going up as well. And occasionally people get that wrong. You know, there, there'll be manufacturing mistakes. We've seen that in some of the recent smartphone incidents or, or hoverboards or you name it. Um, and I think that's it's a constant reminder of, of how important that design is, but it can be done right. It just takes a lot of attention and good engineering up front. And you know, starting when we when we designed the Roadster, the first uh, first pass through this, you know, we were really paranoid about it, and we had this this sort of weight on us that if we screwed this up, if we made big mistakes, that it would set the whole industry back. Um, and I think that was an example of, of how you could, you know, pretty effectively take controls and software and you know, all good engineering work, um, and, and make these batteries very, very safe. They can be much safer than gasoline um, when they're engineered properly. There's probably the, f the, the primary fear of the unknown, to think, well, if we're in this new realm, yeah. you know, it's some, somehow more dangerous. We certainly know that cars colliding with uh, fuel tanks that are full, that's pretty dangerous too. Yeah, well, there, there's always a, a um, sensationalism around new technology. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a gasoline car on fire, you know, every 30 to 60 minutes somewhere in this country. It's happening constantly. You know, people drive by on the road and they'll say, oh, look, a car on fire. You know, of course, it's, it's gasoline, it's plastic. You know, if there's any hint that that was some new technology, you know, if it was a hydrogen vehicle or if it was a battery vehicle, front page news, you know, everyone is, you know, paranoid. There's pictures of Hindenburg and iPhones. So, <laughs> it, you know, it, it's just going to take a little bit of time for people to be desensitized and, and realize the, the true statistics that this is happening, you know, much less frequently. What about the, the automation of cars, uh, which we hear so much about? Uh, you all are looking into that technology. I mean, this gets better and better. Is there, this is certainly the future. Um, is it a safe future, and how quickly do you think it'll spread in the marketplace? Yeah, it's, it's fabulously exciting. You know, this is a, a whole other kind of vector of, of technology innovation happening in the transportation space, and it's coming much faster than people expect. Uh, the improvements in sensors, cameras, computing you know, power to, to read those images and, and make sense of them. Uh, is all accelerating, and you know we'll have you know very autonomous cars in, in not that many years. Uh, the implications are, are going to be profound eventually, and my view is that this is going to start with safety. You know, autonomous systems. Um, the first implementations today are, are really enhanced safety in cars, and all cars have you know some level of autonomy. We just don't maybe think of it as such. You know, cruise control. Um, anti-lock braking systems, even stability control. Any new car you buy today has stability control systems in it, and if you screw up as a driver, it'll eventually you know, take over and kind of handle it for you. That just will keep expanding, and eventually we'll see autonomous systems doing more and more of that kind of safety critical work to the point where eventually you know, the vision is that you have cars that physically can't really get into accidents on their own. You know, that's not science fiction. That's not that hard to imagine. And human drivers are terrible. You know, it's something that, you know, all of us think we're fabulous drivers. Everybody, you know, ha has a very disproportionate view of their capabilities. But as we were discussing earlier, you know, driving ourselves around in a car at 70 miles an hour is the most dangerous thing we do. Yeah. I mean, it's terrifying. You know, if you think about it, you know, you have one lapse of concentration or one, you know, screw up and you can be dead. And, and a lot of people are. And you know, I think when we, when we look to the future, we're going to look back at how we operate cars today and just think we were crazy. You know, just like, you know, we look at driving around in a car without any airbags or seat belts or no ABS and we'd say, oh, wow, I don't even want to get in that thing. It's terrifying. And I think that's how our grandkids are gonna, or kids are going to look back at today's cars and say, wow, you drove that thing with no autonomy, you know, no systems that would avoid an accident. Right. You know, you could have just crashed it. I feel like it will enhance my image. I was really tough. I drove my own car, <laughs> you know. Um, well, uh, there's a lot to contemplate, a lot to be concerned about, but also some things to be excited about. Thank you both for being here. Thank you all very much for listening to us today.